What is up, Bat Family? Welcome to a brand new and the second installment in the Batman Rogues Gallery adaptation series. So, for those of you who don't already know, in case you didn't watch episode one, this is a series dedicated to going over just how I think Matt Reeves' The Batman Universe could adapt any of the future rogues gallery villains that may or may not <laughs> appear in whether that's an upcoming sequel movie or just one of the possible spin-off projects coming years down the line. Again, I do want to stress this is all for fun. This isn't me saying that they're going to be in it, but hey, what if? How would Reeves likely go about it, in my opinion? In episode one, we covered Mr. Freeze, and I just want to say thank you so much for your support on that video. It was just fantastic seeing what you guys had to say. So I'm expecting just as many ideas from you guys in this video's comment section. Feel free to expand on anything we say. Uh, and that is because for episode two, we will be covering none other than Pamela Isley, aka Poison Ivy. So first of all, I, I think it's fairly safe to say that with this rogues gallery villain in particular, Ivy turns up the notch on the dial of Fantastical by, by, by quite a bit, even compared to that of what we covered in episode one with Mr. Freeze. Of course, Mr. Freeze has quite fantastical aspects to his character in this story, but I feel like we did cover some good ground in episode one and how you can unwind the fantastical there, as Reeves says. But with Ivy, as many of you should probably know, in super traditionalist canon, she is a character that is most often portrayed as having the ability to literally control plants, talk to them, cast a hand out in the middle of a street to have a huge vine bursting through. So, so yeah, I, I would say that Ivy is quite up there. So, with that being said, and I'm kind of, you know, going on my tiptoes here because I know people have a lot of opinions about various fantastical villains being adapted in this universe. If Matt Reeves is to adapt them, maybe he will avoid some of them, or maybe not. Maybe he will take one of these characters that we're covering in this series, like Freeze, Ivy, maybe someone else, and still adapt them, but just not in the way that you might want, for example. We'll touch more on that in a second. So right off the bat, when it comes to Ivy, Yes, I'm going to say it, I do have to put a lot of those fantastical aspects aside. Now, to some of you hearing this, I, I know what you're saying, already typing in the comments. You might be like, what? How can you do that with this character? Isn't that what makes Ivy Ivy? Well, the thing is, I heard similar comments, of course, when it came to unwinding the fantastical with Mr. Freeze in episode one. But in my opinion, that there are ways to bring a lot of these characters to fruition in Matt Reeves' world in a way that perhaps many of you might not remotely agree with in terms of what you know as the traditional comic book fantastical version of the character. But if executed in the ways Matt Reeves has described, I maintain the belief in our Lord and Savior, Matt Reeves, but no, jokes aside, I do maintain the belief that there can still be a refreshing and innovative iteration on the characters in a universe that doesn't lean into the fantastical as much as, let's say, uh, the, the upcoming DCU will with its take on those characters. So like if we've got a Poison Ivy in James Gunn's DCU, a Clayface, yeah, expect a full-on blob clay monster, expect a full-on Ivy floating with Ivy plants and vines. That is 100% in the realms of that new universe coming our way. And I know I already went over this a bit in my first video, but just in case anybody is stumbling across this series for the first time on episode two, it's, it's as Matt Reeves said himself, this is why there is a difference. And I, I think some people forget it, but this is the Bible of what is going forward. And he says, I love the fantastical side of Batman. But this iteration, obviously, while being to me, I think it is very comics faithful, but I don't think that this one is necessarily 
it, it doesn't lean as hard into the fantastical, I guess. Now, having said that, it doesn't mean that he won't walk the line of fantastical, and we'll get to that. What does walking the line of fantastical mean? But it, it also means he won't go all out DCU Ivy, all out DCU Clayface, if you get what I'm saying. And that is the whole thing with this Batverse, and it might not be your preference of adaptation if ever hypothetically seeing these particular villains in this Batman saga, because I read a lot of comments about that, as I said, and, and that's okay. Maybe if you don't like that and you're like, nope, this isn't the character, maybe you'll get your all out fantastical fix with the DCU Batman. Or maybe, and I think this is what will be the case for a lot of people, if one of these fantastical villains are adapted, perhaps you might need to see it to believe it, as they say, for you to deem it that it can be done justice without incorporating the superpower aspects. Because again, right off the knee-jerk reaction, I think a lot of people are like, no, but then maybe when they see the movie, they'll be like, oh, okay, maybe I kind of like the way Reeves done this. You know, my preference is still maybe a DCU version of Ivy going all out with those powers. But hey, I doubted this initially. It just sounded like, oh, she's just going around with a bunch of, I don't know, poisonous leaves in Reeves' world. And that's it. No, like, there can still be a pretty deep story there. And so, regardless, when talking about the more fantastical characters in this video series, I must adhere to the world we're working with here. So with that said, let's first talk about Pamela Isley's background. Poison Ivy, who is she? I know many of you know full well who she is, but I just want to cater to everyone in this series. Also, just, you know, generalize it anyway for the character that we're working with here and how you know, we can imagine Reeves using this character. So, of course, traditionally, Ivy is a botanist, a, a biochemist. She's misanthropic. She, she doesn't really like people. So, you know, has typically been shown to have a disdain for other human beings, if you will. Largely stemming from the way the world, you know, civilization as a collective treats nature. And if there's one thing we know about Ivy and, and how she views nature... Yeah, she, she doesn't take that for granted. So, which is, of course, you know, a reflection of a real-world problem that our planet is dealing with today, which can also be reflected in the movie because Matt Reeves took a similar approach with the first film. So, as a result of this, you know, Ivy, as we all know, she resorts to extreme measures of eco-terrorism with her powers, acting as, you know, sometimes even the avatar of nature, even being imbued with powers from the elemental force in DC comics known as the green and that is a big shout out to my boy swamp thing and so when looking at poison ivy stories retrospectively uh, she is relentless uh, to do what she can to fight for nature of which is pretty much defenseless from humans to balance the scales of bringing nature back onto the map the thing that makes ivy so interesting is that she truly and whole heartedly believes in this cause. So on the one hand, it doesn't seem so bad at face value that, you know, she's fighting for Mother Nature. But on the other hand, Ivy goes through such lengths of extremism to achieve this goal that she is often paired with those who are crazy enough to end up at Arkham Asylum. So the more you somewhat take this character study approach of Ivy, the more fascinating it gets. You know, she views what humanity has done to Mother Nature as crueler and, and point blank more irredeemable than anything. Anything she could do that might cause some collateral damage to humanity. So with that and the potential collateral damage that can come about from Ivy's antics, if you will, as a result of her efforts to succeed, just really bottom line make her a very very formidable villain to that of batman and the world and of course ivy is always portrayed as a drop dead gorgeous beautiful woman and even has powers that allow her to have influence over others and is often portrayed with looks that involve you know vines extending around her body and whatnot so with all of that said about ivy who she is what she's about here's the thing Here's the thing, to get to the point here, we're going to have to do quite a bit of unwinding and rethink the way we traditionally 
perceive poison ivy in the power department specifically the power department yet still see how she could be portrayed as faithfully as she can be in the batman universe something very important to keep in mind and as i went over quite a lot in my mr freeze video in episode one all while we're going to take away you know the very unrealistic attributes to these you know more powerful or metahuman characters we can actually still adapt them while walking the line of fantastical and matt reeves's the batman universe so we're going back to this now so what i mean by that specifically is that we can still incorporate some unrealistic aspects to that of ivy while not going overboard in the ways that i aforementioned and in ways that clearly matt reeves just wouldn't do that you've heard it from the horse's mouth the most obvious being the supernatural-esque control over all plant life very quickly as well I, I i noticed in my previous comment section people ask me why do you keep saying the word fantastical what what does that mean it, it just simply means something that isn't realistic you know lacking in reality bottom line something that only exists in fantasies thus fantastical i think some of the comments asking this actually think i mean fantastic but no fantastical is just like a you know metahuman poison ivy floating around with plants and vines and everything that is based in fantasy it is lacking in reality first off with this she can still most certainly be most certainly be dr pamela Isley. That doesn't need to go anywhere, and if anything, is quite a cornerstone for her in a more believable universe. I mean, after all, Matt Reeves has set the precedent with his universe of characters in that most of them are in their infancy. Just look at where we're at in the first movie, from that of the Joker being put away for the first time in Batman Year One, the Riddler emerging for the first time in Batman Year Two, the Penguin is Falcone's right-hand man, and now he's getting a series where he's gonna rise to Kingpin. Everything in the rogues gallery department is very, 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 very early on, just like the Batman who's still becoming in year two in the first movie. And so with Ivy's eventual villainous display, it would likely be a first time thing for Gotham City to witness from her. With a background to her before this that obviously fleshes out her origins, similar to how we had that with Paul Dano's Edward Nashton, of whom was a forensic accountant, nobody knew of him, and yet there was still a journey that evolved him to get to the point of his evolution and thus first villainous acts in Gotham. That started with the mayor. So for the first example here, obviously keeping Dr. Pamela Isley in mind, she could be portrayed as maybe the most promising botanist the world has ever seen let's just start there of whom conducts work in this field on the cutting edge of botany this still gives her the the somewhat foundation of her backstory of having an extensive extensive knowledge of the biology of plants that their structure their biochemical processes you name it so at this point feel free to pitch down in the comment sections to expand on this but perhaps along the way there could be a storyline in where dr pamela isley is trying to launch some form of global restoration program that will span out to all major cities over the world of which maybe and uh, conveniently starts in gotham city this very thing that she's trying to do would be fundamental to her plans to make a change in the world and where humanity for the most part has ignorantly abandoned the very life force that earth provides and we all know that in our world today as well that there are groups that feel extremely strong about climate change nature leading to protests raising awareness and oh god i know what people are going to say now boba you're just with this rogues gallery adaptation series episode two you're just pitching a race Aging Greta Thunberg, aren't you? No. No, I'm not. But going along this direction, so imagine someone so driven by this with many struggles along the way that that chip away at her mental fortitude, similar to, you know, not identical, but a lot of the rogues somewhat struggle with th these, you know, emotional standpoints, like Paul Dano's Edward Nashen, his mental state getting chipped and chipped and chipped away. Name another rogues gallery character. Ivy, with her persistence, her patience, suffers a, a similar downward spiral that eventually results in a response of extremism. And, and this would ring true to what Matt Reeves has strived to do in the first film and and as i said that's reflect certain parts 
of reality. So to dive into that one for a second and to get our minds a little bit more into how this can be done with Ivy, Matt Reeves did say that, you know, with the Riddler, Gotham in many ways can feel like our world, such as the social media mob that, that the Riddler uses. Matt Reeves wanted it to connect so that the audiences could see a character that's beloved to them that felt fresh, but also relevant to them. So with regards to Ivy there, perhaps something similar can be done. So along the way in Ivy's journey in this very <laughs> rough outline here, maybe she just runs into many troubles that compromise her efforts that she spent the majority of her professional life striving towards. This could be due to a number of things. It could be that it's thwarted by the government. Perhaps notable characters from the source material could put a halt in her plans. There could be those who protest these changes in regulations that many citizens don't care for, highlighting the ignorance to things like climate change, which in turn would highlight the disregard for human life she has and only further embolden it. You could even maybe, and this is where I would love to see your ideas, chuck in what the Riddler did at the end of the first movie with the flooding perhaps that compromised her projected plans and after already dealing with months and if not years of of delays challenges she might take it into her own hands to expedite her dream bottom line her tireless efforts drive her to the point of still enacting those plans by any means necessary as true with poison ivy fashion if there's collateral damage of humans oh, i don't care you know, at least nature's coming back. Either way, even with that very rough outline there, like maybe yours in the comments expands on it so much more like, Boba, why didn't you point this out? This would have made so much more sense than what you were saying. Ivy undoubtedly needs her story to be incorporated into this world in a way that fits with the lens of what Matt Reeves strives for with his characters. And as he says himself, when talking about the villains or even Batman himself, it's an opportunity to look at the characters from an emotional standpoint and to really look at human nature. And I do think that would be very interesting, given what Matt Reeves just said there, to look at Ivy's human nature or somewhat lack of and, and what really drove her to this extreme misanthropic state. And there, there are more ideas here uh, that we're about to get into. Matt Reeves even goes on to say it, it has to be personal. You, you have to have a kind of empathetic relationship with the characters, an emotional reality, to not simply cast, let's say, Ivy as a supervillain. Because as Matt Reeves says, it, it can feel reductive and cast them in a certain light. He wanted to sort of tear that down and let them be reflections of the city. And of course, for example, with the Riddler, Matt Reeves goes on to say he comes by his path honorably in that he went through tremendous trauma himself. But is this the right path? Certainly not. It turns to violence, but at the same time, we're meant to have empathy for him. So through putting the audience in the shoes of the characters, if you can force them to confront the question of how they might react in the same place, it can be a meditation on the struggle within all of us. And Gotham is a perfect microcosm of that. This is where we, we could enter the seeming formula of what Matt Reeves describes as this epic crime saga, and where Ivy refusing to abandon her life's work could earn the name of the Poison Ivy Killer. But here's the thing, when I say out loud, the Poison Ivy Killer, one thing we must consider at the same time is that this is where we could enter the territory of not wanting to repeat the same processes with each rogues gallery character in the main trilogy. And what I mean more specifically there is how do we step away from what sounds like the formula of doing a serial killer every time, like the Riddler, the Riddler killer, the Riddler live streams, this Poison Ivy killer. I stress the same thing even with Mr. Freeze. I, I think it would be a bit too formulaically similar if he was trying to save his wife, or let's just say he lost his wife and he just goes throughout the movie freezing people or killing people in, in certain grounded ways that reflect Mr. Freeze one after another. It just would seem a bit too similar there. Maybe not as Riddlery, but it needs to differentiate itself. But to be honest, maybe Ivy's reaction to the catalyst, whether, as I said with the Mr. Freeze video as well, perhaps a lot of this context happens before the events of when the movie picks up and we already stumble across an Ivy who's lost everything and, and expedites her own dream through 
doing anything by any means necessarily. Similar to what we said with Mr. Freeze and how you learn the backstory along the way, perhaps you start to identify with what happened with that villain. Let's just say Ivy's persistence with carrying out her mission and, and people dying as a result. Maybe that wouldn't actually come across as too similar to mysterious serial killings from that of the Riddler in the first movie. Because no matter what, when you evaluate it, even from the source material, when you look at any villain that could be adapted in the Batman part two or part three, people die as a result. That's kind of what happens in big rogues gallery character stories. While we're talking about similarities, the one thing that will be consistent in this trilogy is that Robert Pattinson's Batman will likely always have a heavy focus on the world's greatest detective, as Matt Reeves describes it, an intricate detective story. And I think Ivy would provide a fantastic detective story. So with Ivy, sure that there could be some killings involved. And of course, she might have to get her hands dirty with what she wants to do. But it's important to differentiate it, as I said, from the first movie's approach while keeping the detective driven focus. So that is still a Batman crime saga, this epic crime saga themed story with each main movie installment. And a way to still introduce aspects like this, of which I feel can be totally believable, is that given Pamela Isley's expertise, she could most certainly, when having taken a turn, use her knowledge of botany to perhaps include murders in this story that involve, well, of course, plants. And I've always, always imagined this, this, this crime scene in where Batman and Gordon enter a room similar to that of, let's just say, the mayor's death towards the beginning of the first movie. But instead of stumbling across a typical murder victim, they see a victim consumed by nature. And what I've always liked about this, this little vision, and I'm sure plenty of people have thought of a similar crime scene if Ivy was to ever be adapted into this movie trilogy. In my mind, combining this with whatever research Ivy has been conducting, it, it gives her the tools that would create a scenario in the imagery of DC's Swamp Thing show. Now, maybe a lot of people haven't seen that. I really liked it. I, I wish it carried on. But there was a couple of deaths early on, and some of you may remember it if you've seen it, if not, I'm probably showing something on screen right now, in where this person's body had this plant-like matter growing from the inside out. And of course, all while this is very far-reaching and, and not really realistic, it walks the line of fantastical in a way that I feel like a Reeves project with Ivy could certainly draw influence from. Something basic to imagine here would be uh, imagining someone's food or drink being spiked with a seed, which has an unnatural and unrealistic accelerated plant growth to the point of where eventually what you're seeing right now happens. It, it doesn't feel as out of this world to me as Ivy floating around with plants carrying her around the place. What's also really cool about, let's just say, this is a method of perhaps people getting killed in the movie, it would provide for a very body horror type crime scene and would even allow for Batman's detective skills to come out through taking forensic samples of this plant matter growing out of the body of victims back to the Batcave to look into exactly how this cause of death came to be cross-referencing the plant matter to a company that perhaps uses it, perhaps even Wayne Enterprises, because Ivy has worked in one of their research divisions before. I mean, hell, if things got to the very extreme, I mean, we, we have villains out there such as Scarecrow, who is a very realistic villain to adapt. Again, it's just drugs. Of whom, if he had the chance, he would put fear toxins across the entirety of Gotham to just watch everyone claw themselves to death. So perhaps after Ivy's break, and this is again where things are going mega extreme here, she could want to purge the city of humanity through a similar way of somehow getting her methods into many households that results in similar horrific deaths. And where after that, the plant life spreads like mold on the walls once in the homes of Gotham citizens. But again, that does sound quite like extreme but then again ivy does go to extreme lengths it's, it's kind of all about finding the balance there in this universe so when we go down that line there is another idea that i know is a big and popular one 
with a lot of fans out there. Perhaps Pamela Isley can even have quite a traumatic childhood as well. So this is where you can tie in the influences. And again, as I said, the popular one that a lot of fans like the idea of, such as the story of Rappuccini's daughter. Now, if you don't already know what that is about, the plot is described as, it is about Giacomo Rappuccini, a medical researcher in Padua who grows a garden of poisonous plants. He brings up his daughter to tend the plants and she becomes resistant to the poisons. But in the process, she herself becomes poisonous to others. Now, I do really dig this aspect of the story because all while it isn't necessarily realistic in terms of someone in a realistic world becoming resistant to poisons and whose very touch is poisonous to others, it could, as I keep mentioning, perhaps be incorporated in some way with, as I said, you know, walking the line of fantastical there, I implementing some unrealistic aspects without going so overboard like flying around with plants. Perhaps they could maybe ground this with some science, albeit with some invented logic that is without too much explanation. But, you know, as I've often said, Matt Reeves says he tried to also ground the Planet of the Apes movies in a world like ours. And obviously Caesar in those movies and the other apes who can talk aren't remotely realistic. So that's what a lot of people like to point out as well. Grounding it, unwinding the fantastical doesn't always mean hyper-realistic, like Nolan's Batman. You can walk the line, but what's important to remember is that I don't think Reeves will go above and beyond. And so with that being said, I do think that this example could be the absolute limit in Matt Reeves' Batman saga of what he'd potentially be willing to do with walking the line of fantastical aspects of these characters. And in Ivy's case here, the Rappuccini's daughter comparison could be a very, very interesting approach. Maybe we could look at it as Ivy through those early year experiments. Maybe her blood is, is poisonous but not necessarily her touch. And all she needs to do is get a drop of her blood somehow ingested or maybe just even exposed to the skin of another person or saliva or maybe even pheromones in contact with another person and they could be exposed to Ivy's toxins. No matter what though, with Rappuccini's daughter, I think it is such a good influence for this movie to take because we've gone over maybe a present day catalyst that could break Ivy. But what if we wind back the clocks a little bit and get into what made her more that person who's vulnerable to going to those extreme lengths that I outlined earlier on to cultivate that story? Perhaps Ivy, yeah, has grown up isolated for the majority of her upbringing in her father's garden. Maybe she does have a unique condition that we're just not thinking of right now. Maybe that's a part of her medical research as well. I don't know, let me know, expand on it. And maybe there's abuse from her father being more interested in his scientific progress and experiments than that of his daughter's actual life of which he just uses as a lab rat. And this could induce the, the trauma that Reeves often looks for with regards to his movies. And growing up isolated, even if you want to take the bare minimum from Rappuccini's daughter's story, again, maybe her, her dad experiments on her um, and she just doesn't see anyone else because she doesn't go in the outside world. She still gets an education somehow. Maybe she's, you know, taught at home. I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, it would also give her the way that she's completely disconnected from other people. She's misanthropic there. Uh, and her only friends is nature. It's all she's known right her father uh, takes advantage of using her as basically a lab rat he, he surrounds her with plant life uh, because that's somewhat of the field he's in with his experiments and so she talked to the plants she's a kid growing up having imaginary friends her only comfort is nature so not people and what does she associate people with people like her dad and i'm not saying you know as she grows older and maybe gets a job at wayne enterprises that she hasn't you know clued up to the world with how there are somewhat nice people out there but it's very psychologically damaging from an origin standpoint now again no matter what you can take something from the rappuccini's daughter's story and put it into ivy in the Reeves Batverse. And for those of you who've listened to Batman Unburied, the, the somewhat Spotify storyline, which was freaking awesome, by the way, this is very similar in where Ivy's father experimented on her and she became resistant to plants as well. Now, I don't think she'll necessarily become resistant 
to things in the Reeves world, but that's not negating that there could be some uh, side effects from that of what her father has done, you know, through keeping her locked up her whole life, uh, at least up until, I don't know, 16 to 18 or something like that, uh, and where she had some kind of blood poisoning or something where it doesn't necessarily kill her, but it can be toxic to other people, things like that. Or maybe it does affect her lifespan. There's all kinds of ideas, but that could all feed into the poison ivy aspect of of the ivy in this world but ladies and gentlemen and bat family out there i think i'm gonna end my rambles there uh with, with this episode two again i just wanted to throw enough at the wall uh, to you guys, uh, get my ideas out there, what Matt Reeves has said about it, see what you think sticks, maybe you can wipe some of the paint off the wall and then leave that up there, or paint your own color with your own ideas. Weird analogy, but as I said, uh, how do you think they can give Ivy a, a personal and empathetic story? What can be done here? Do you agree or disagree with anything that I've said? Do you downright think that Ivy just cannot be done? Any of the more fantastical villains can't be done? I personally do disagree with that. I think given enough time being a writer like Matt Reeves and Matson Tomlin if they had like a year to cook up a script of like a grounded yet walking the line fantastical Ivy they could really do a good job perhaps inspired by Rappuccini's daughter perhaps with some of the ideas I said earlier with maybe trying to be a bit of a, an activist with her botany and biochemistry research and stuff but it all kind of going wrong but it's somewhat rooted back to the trauma of her childhood there's all of that you can marry together in a grounded ivy and with methods of killing as well uh with some unrealistic aspects such as the seeds the swamp thing-esque plant growth with some of the deaths the the investigation and detective story that batman could go on i just can't wait to read what you guys have to say uh if you've got to this point of the video as well i would love to know your suggestions for what villain could be discussed in episode three do you want it to be scarecrow professor pig clay face like you name it but other than that guys please 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 like this video if you got this far and also if you got this far i haven't done this in a while leave the hashtag with whatever comment you're going to put down in that comment section hashtag nature always wins but with that being said guys subscribe for more videos like this but i hope you have a lovely rest of your day thank you so much for watching and i'll see you bat family in the next video goodbye